Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Jay Singh, and I will be your host for this NASA Technology Transfer Program webinar on NASA Ames Mechanical, Mechanical and Fluid Systems Technologies. Our presenter today is Grace Belantic, and she will be speaking about the CO2 Cold Surface Deposition System, also known as CDEP um, technology. Following Grace's presentation on the technology, I will be giving a short presentation on how to license NASA technology. Before we get started, I'd like to point out that your microphones will be muted throughout this presentation. So if you have any questions, please type them in the chat box and we will answer them during the Q&A session at the end. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Grace. Take it away. Okay, hello everyone. Let me uh, share my presentation. Okay. So thank you, Jay, for the introduction. As you mentioned, I'll be talking about the CO2 deposition system for cold surfaces, or CDEP for short. And uh, just to jump into it, I like to show this picture just to uh, give a little uh, background of what I'm talking about here. So um, this is looking inside of our system. On the left, you, on the, on the right, you see two different types of ice. Um, on the left, you see water ice being deposited onto this cold surface. And on the right, uh, you see CO2 ice. And I just like appreciating the different types of uh, structures that these ice formations make. And talking about why we want both water ice and CO2 ice separated, I'm going to go into how the system works. Uh, there. Okay, sorry, my mouse is not working. Um, so why do we care about doing a cold surface deposition for CO2? Well, our CO2 removal system that's currently on the International Space Station works well but it does require maintenance. So there's an effort underway for developing a new, highly reliable CO2 removal system for future long duration manned missions. So when we go onwards to the moon, either orbiting, landing, or habitat, or to Mars, uh, these are multi-year missions and we can't do maintenance with anything with what we bring with us. So the longer our systems last without touching them, the better. And so uh, CO2 removal or CDEP is an uh, excellent uh, potential for that technology. Um, we're also using cryocoolers, and those are a very well-established technology. Uh, they've been flown in space many times. They're used in numerous terrestrial applications. We know how they work. Uh, they generate cold surface as well, so it was easy to apply them into a system. And then to give a little bit of history, um, JPL actually initially investigated the use of cryocoolers in the MOXIE experiment on the Perseverance rover that's currently on Mars um, to collect CO2 directly from the Martian atmosphere for in-situ resource utilization, or ISRU for short. And since Martian atmosphere is essentially pure CO2, about 96%, but at a low pressure, um, they considered that this, if this could be potentially useful for atmospheric applications, so air, but with a low partial pressure of CO2, on the same order of magnitude as the Martian atmosphere in terms of total amount of CO2. And so they did some initial testing with a cryo cooler in various uh, CO2 partial pressure atmospheres, and it worked well. And we um, took over from there and developed the CDEP system. So how does CDEP actually work? Um, it capitalizes on the differences between the condensation or deposition, depending on what species we're talking about here, uh, temperatures of air components to selectively deposit CO2 from cabin atmosphere. Um, so as you cool down air, you first either liquefy or freeze out water, uh, depending on the humidity concentration levels, and then you would deposit out CO2 because um, of the phase diagram. And then if you went even further colder, you would start to liquefy oxygen and further. But as long as you don't go that cold, uh, you are selectively um, depositing CO2. Um, however, the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere uh, dictates how cold you actually need to go. So as the CO2 air concentration decreases, so does the deposition temperature. Uh, for example, at the spacecraft, a concentration of 2 torr or 2600 ppm, um, we, uh, it would start to deposit at 142 Kelvin. To actually remove gross amounts of CO2 from the atmosphere, we have to cool further to about 110 to 130 Kelvin. And as much as we would like to cool just the CO2 out of the air, you can't do that. We have to cool the entire airflow to deposit out that CO2. So how do we cool the CO2 out of the air? Uh, we do that by generating a cold surface in the airflow path. And like I mentioned, we're currently using cryocoolers, specifically Sterling cryocoolers, because these are readily available in Earth applications and gravity. Uh, you would do, potentially do it different ways in, um, in space, for example. But cryocoolers work everywhere. And to generate the cold surface, 
you need a high surface area to mass ratio to ensure that CO2 diffusion path is as short as possible so that you collect them as efficiently as possible. So the design of your cold surface factors in just as much as your source of cooling, which is essentially cryocoolers. Um, and then once you collect your CO2, uh, your system fills up, you have to regenerate the system and get your CO2 product out for conversion into useful products or storage downstream. So we turn off our system and start to warm it up and pure CO2 sublimates at about 196 Kelvin. But if you want to increase the pressure further, you just increase the temperature further to what you desire to need. So that's essentially how it works. Um, but I want to give you a diagram of how the system's actually broken out in existence. Um, so I'll point out here, do I have a laser pointer? That would be useful. Let's see. There it is. Okay. There we go. Um, we have um, eight different Sterling cryocoolers you can see in the system here. A set of one, a set of three, and then a parallel set of one and three. That's because the set of four cryocoolers here are actively collecting CO2 while this set is regenerating and producing the CO2 product and it switches back and forth. So only four cryocoolers are, are on at a time. And there's a set of, there's a one here and three here because this is a pre-cooler which helps to cool down the air and collect any residual water that's in the air. And this one collects the actual CO2 product. Um, we also have heat exchangers, which are incredibly important to reducing the overall power of the system. Because like I mentioned before, we have to cool the entire air to get the CO2 out. We might as well use all that cooling power that we generated to help cool the incoming air. So these are high efficiency air to air heat exchangers to help cool our incoming air. Okay, so let me walk through how this goes. Um, just to give you a sense of scale, this is for a metabolic load of four people, so it collects about four kilograms of CO2 a day. Okay, So air comes in here from the left, and it's coming at about 26 standard cubic feet per minute. Uh, it goes through this bulk humidity removal system. Uh, we haven't confirmed how that, what that's going to be yet, but that could be any type of desiccant system you'd like. Um, it then comes in and goes through the first heat exchanger, cools down some. Uh, goes through the pre-cooler where any residual air is collected. We have dry air, very dry air, then comes out, goes through the second heat exchanger, CO2 is deposited onto the surface. The CO2-free air then comes back this way, and it's regenerating this pre-cooler, pulling out the humidity, residual humidity we collected, and this heat exchanger as well, so that they're regenerated. It then goes back through our desiccation system to pull out any residual or leftover humidity we have from that to regenerate it. And then our nice CO2-free humid air returns to the cabin. While that's happening, uh, the CO2 here is subliming and flowing downstream uh, to be either converted back to oxygen or for water or any type of useful product or storage you would like. Um, so that's the general overview of how the system works. Uh, this is what our initial system looks like in real life. Um, this is a smaller scale version. This was scaled for about a metabolic load of one person or one kilogram of CO2 removal a day. But the general setup is about the same. Uh, we have air that's pre-dried coming in here. Um, it goes through this first heat exchangers, which is actually a set of two stacked plate heat exchangers. It goes through the pre-cooler. We only have one because it's a lower uh, water load, so we didn't need to continuously regenerate it like I showed you previously. That's why there's just one. It goes through the second heat exchanger goes through this chamber here. Uh, the cryocoolers are underneath this plate. You can't really see them, sorry. And then while this uh, second chamber here is regenerating CO2. And then the air goes back through first this heat exchanger and then the second heat exchanger, and then back out into the air. And I wanted to show the system prior to insulating just so you can see everything that's happening, but insulation is a huge part of the effectiveness to the system because uh, thermal control is extremely important. So that's the three main factors of thermal control. One is your cold surface, how efficiently you're capturing CO2, your heat exchangers, how well you're maintaining uh, your power requirements, and then the insulation, how well you're preventing heat leak. Um, so those are important factors to the system. But uh, going back to the uh, four-person scale system that we're currently working on building, I wanted to give you a zoom in on uh, what the cold surface actually looks like. Um, so here's what the deposition chamber looks like, and it's uh, see-through here a little bit, so you can see the cold surface inside, and we have three sterling coolers uh, thermally linked to it. Uh, zooming in onto this cold surface, uh, you can see a cutaway of all of these uh, chevron fins, and uh, we did it this way to one, once I said, maximize surface area to mass ratio, 
and two, uh, we can actually 3D print this uh, as one, sing one single piece out of a copper alloy um, without any use of support materials. So easily installed into our system and good to go and collect CO2. Um, so that's how the system works in a nutshell, but why do we want to do it this way over various other ways that exist to remove CO2? Well, it utilizes solely thermal control to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. So what that means is there's no need for typical CO2 removal solvents. No zeolites, no activated charcoals, no MOFs, uh, metal organic frameworks, things like that. Um, you also aren't limited to how you generate that cold surface. We use Sterling cryocoolers because they have a high efficiency, but you can use any type of cryocoolers. If you're in deep space, you can use thermal radiators to reject heat to deep space, which eliminates your power requirements altogether. Uh, you can use cryogenics if you have readily available, bit, readily available liquid oxygen or nitrogen, for example. Those all work well. Um, all those components we're using are already well developed. Uh, heat exchangers are well known, coolers are well known, insulation is well known. Uh, we're just combining them in a unique and novel way in order to capture CO2. And because everything we're using is already well developed, uh, everything's highly reliable. Nothing really requires maintenance, so we don't need to swap out consumables like sorbents. So it should work for a really long time without us, any human involvement. And there's also minimal moving parts. The only thing that moves on this system is the valves that switch back into the airflow back and forth between the two systems. So really uh, straightforward and easy to deal with. Um, we also don't have to compress our CO2 because we're depositing. We now have a CO2 ice block that we just control the sublimation rate to however fast we want uh, using heat leak or uh, heaters, for example. That way we get downstream CO2 product pressure however we like. Um, and we're not limited to just capturing CO2. Anything with a thermal gradient that we can utilize to separate gas components, we can do. So we can capture volatile organic compounds that can assist with trace contaminant control or anything you might have in your gas stream. Um, we're studying what all goes into our current uh, cabin atmosphere now, actually, as well. Uh, we can also accommodate humidity. And if desired, with a little bit of a redesign, uh, we can provide a liquid water stream out of that pre-cooler I showed. Um, we also, rather than rejecting copious amounts of heat to the atmosphere, for example, when you're using a sorbent system that you have to heat to high temperatures, you have to reject a bunch of heat. Since we're actually cooling and are trying to prevent heat leak into the system, we have a net cooling effect on the environment rather than heat rejection effect. There is some heat rejection coming out of our sterling coolers, but that's minimized uh, through various means. And so depending on your environment requirements, that's really useful, for example, with spacecraft. Um, it's also incredibly easy for startup. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, it's unaffected by dormancy. You can turn the system on and off, no problem. And it doesn't matter how long it's been turned off. Nothing in the system is going to affect it. And it turns right back on, no problem, anytime you want. Um, and then finally, uh, because student coolers, depending on how you do the system, does require a lot of power to use, but we reduce those power needs with high effectiveness air-to-air -air heat exchangers. And I did not turn off my tapes, I'm sorry. Um, OK, so applications for this type of system. Um, Obviously, we're looking in for the space environment, so spacecrafts, uh, orbiters, landers, habitats, any enclosed environment and any gravity, we can do CO2 control. But that's not limited to space applications. That could be done in any terrestrial application as well. So submarines is one great example, or office buildings where there's plenty of humans that respire uh, CO2. Uh, this type of method is scalable to all different metabolic loads and CO2 concentrations. I showed you the one person and the four person loads, but um, as you increase the number of people, the size of the system does not increase linearly with the size, with the number of people that you're doing metabolic load for, which is very useful. For example, in office buildings or higher population environments. But you can also uh, change the CO2 concentration that you're going for. So at a lower CO2 concentration, for example, in direct air capture, it still works well. And a higher CO2 concentration, for example, in blue gas scrubbing, it also is a great application. Um, and that's really all I had to talk about. So I will open the floor to questions. And thank you for listening and about my new system for you. So let's see you up.